right, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm uh, here to talk about a module that we delivered just recently, um, earlier this year, in fact, uh, which followed a foot uh, classroom approach. Um, but to start off with, um, i tell you a little bit about us, as you could be forgiven for knowing nothing about Cranfield or being able to point to it on a map. We're not a very big place. Um, the closest thing to us is actually, well, we're in the midst of fields of sheep, to be honest, but um, uh, we're nearest to Milton Keynes, is the nearest big municipality. Uh, the campus looks an awful lot like a military base, because it is one, or it was one, anyway. Um, but it has now transformed into a small university that is focused on sort of engineering, technology, um, and management. And so we have our four schools now on um, energy, environment, ag agri-food, aerospace, and transport manufacturing. And as you can see there in the picture, we do actually have our own airport. So uh, the aerospace side is actually quite big. Um, management, we also have our own business school, and uh, we have a defense arm as well, because we do have to still maintain quite strong links to the MOD. Um, we are a postgraduate-only university, which is somewhat unique in this country. Um, we have only postgraduate students, uh, master's level and PhD level, uh, along with uh, quite a number of CPD-style uh, courses, particularly uh, through business school. Uh, the important thing to pick out from this is uh, just like those little bits at the end about our, our student makeup. We have a lot of part-time students uh, who come to us uh, to study courses part-time whilst in full-time employment. We also have a lot of international students from outside the UK. So these are all considerations we, that are front and center whenever we're looking at uh, you know, new materials or new approaches to teaching and learning. Um, just to point out that uh, the, the module that I'm going to talk about was part of our MSc in uh, Water and Wastewater Engineering. Um, as my, my title implies, I work in the uh, Water Sciences Institute at Cranfield. So it's primarily an engineering-based uh, group looking at a sort of water treatment and technology and stuff. I'm actually a social scientist, so being tasked to deliver a, a sort of an engineering-based module uh, was somewhat daunting. Uh, but the the course itself um, covers a lot of aspects about water and wastewater treatment and the water sector primarily in the UK. And the topic of the module itself um, was actually water reuse. Uh, so it, it encompassed a lot of aspects about water reuse and you know, turning um, uh, sewage effluent into usable forms of water again. Um, and that encompassed a lot of social elements as well. So it was, it was technology focused but had a broad range of topics as well. So that kind of made it uniquely suited to this flipped approach to be able to bring together all these different aspects um, uh, through, a, through the module. Um, so why did we opt for a flipped classroom approach? Well, I think the, the, the rationale for this, uh, this particular mechanism is fairly well established. There's sort of a growing recognition among higher education sectors in general that traditional lecturing, standing, and delivering formats, um, which I'm well aware is, is actually what I'm doing right now. Uh, but these, these sort of traditional standing and delivering formats are possibly not the best use of, of class time. And I think particularly given the changes in the UK higher edu education sector and the, you know, all the emphasis on tuition fee rises and costs and what are students actually paying for and things like that, <laughs> there's a huge new emphasis now on what is the student experience and how can we you know, have a, have a really worthwhile student experience um, on campus for those who, who come to attend. So, so a lot of it is based around making just the best use of class time. You know, is, is, is the best use of class time really someone standing there at the front just narrating something that they've done a hundred times? Um, or is it, can we use that class time uh, a bit more interactively? Uh, encouraging active rather than passive learning. So it's uh, a flipped approach is definitely about um, getting students into a more active frame of mind, particularly during that face-to-face -face time, rather than just sitting and absorbing um, information. Using up-to-date technology effectively. Um, we, I mean, a flipped classroom approach relies quite heavily on uh, online materials and, uh, uh, and technology-enhanced learning. Uh, and for, I think, you know, these, there's such promise in these tools now. I think particularly for Cranfield, as we are, you know, technology-focused university. I think we have a, 
probably a responsibility of making the best use of technology that we possibly can uh, if we're going to sit and make that claim. Uh, so it is, it is largely about uh, trying to make the best use of technology opportunities as well. And also there is a lot of research to suggest that these flipped approaches can offer a lot more support for students with learning difficulties or language difficulties. So again, for us, that's a big concern because we have so many students whose first language is not English. Um, and it, you know, there's a lot of advantages offered by the sort of online side and the ability to sort of uh, stop and rewind bits that you don't understand and play them over and over again, and stuff like that. But that really does seem to offer quite a lot more support uh, for students with these kinds of difficulties. So this is the basic idea of a flip, uh, flip approach. Um, rather than the traditional format of a lecturer standing at the front and then sending all the students away to do homework activities, those two activities are reversed. Um, so all of the sort of more passive content delivery is put online. Uh, students will work through that before coming to class. And then in class is much more focused on group activities, applying the knowledge that they gained through the, uh, sort of absorbing those online materials, working through problems, asking questions, and just being a lot more interactive and engaging. So it's a, it's a very different use of class time. Um, it started mainly in school classrooms. So it's, it's, I think it's a, an American approach originally. Um, and it's been used in uh, a lot of grade schools and things in the US as a way, and, and the sort of premise is students do their homework in class instead of at home. So they do all the lecturing side at home, work through that, and then they come to class to talk with their teacher and actually work through the actual practical side in class. So that's the basic premise, but it's sort of slowly been transitioning into, into the higher education sectors as well. So again, Cranfield is a little unique in this sense um, because, because we are postgraduate only, um, and the bulk of our teaching is on uh, one-year mass-taught master's programs. Um, so our tradition, we have sort of a standard module structure that goes along with these uh, one-year taught masters, which looks like this. Um, you do a week of intensive in-class time, lecturing, lab work, whatever, um, and those there's, there's are full-day sessions. And then you have a week off, which is mainly sort of private study, homework, things like that, or completing an assignment. Um, and it's sort of week on, week off, week on, week off. That's sort of our standard year-long structure for the top components. So for us, because uh, it, I was doing this, had to do this flipped module uh, sort of at the end of our taught sessions, so it had to fit within this particular structure because it came on the tail end and, and had to fit with all the rest of them. Um, so the easiest thing for us was simply to flip those two weeks round. <laughs> Um, do you like my fancy animations? <laughs> um, this is me making these the best use of technology. Uh, but yeah, it's just to flip those two weeks around, um, and we, had, we set them up slightly differently so that the, the home week uh, was about the online lectures and the readings and the exercises, which were compiled online. And then the second week uh, had a bit, had all the interactive stuff. So we incorporated a field trip into this, uh, a series of workshops, a little bit of lecturing, although it was minimized, um, and then they also completed um, their assignment within that week as well. Now, uh, again, this kind of worked, uh, as I said, because it fit with the previous structure, uh, also because the numbers of our students are manageable. Uh, I mean, on this course, we typically have between 20 and 30 students, between the full-timers full and the part-timers, um, and on this particular one, we had about 20. Uh, so. It did, you know, with larger numbers, a structure like this would probably be somewhat more difficult, um, you know, with undergraduates and different structures. I'm not sure how it would work. But for us, this, this worked quite well. Oh, and the other thing to mention is, as a, you know, because we have so many part-timers, and on this, uh, probably just over a third of the students on this module were part-timers. Um, so one of the really important things we had to be mindful of was how this was going to work for them. And uh, we did try and make sure that all of the online stuff was compiled and ready to go quite a ways before uh, the actual start date of the module, which was in February. So we had tried to release all of the online content in January, um, specifically so that part-timers had a lot more time to work through it. Because, this, um, because of the week, the two-week two structure that we have, 
our part-timers for this course typically take a week off of their work to come for the intense in-person week. So we had to think, well, if they're only going to get a week off of work, that's the only time they're going to be given. We have to think what they're going to be using that week for. And obviously for this, it's going to be for the contact week. We have to make sure they have plenty of time to be able to do the online stuff, because that's going to take, they're going to have to be doing that around their full-time job. Um, so that was a big consideration for us. And we did, you know, we were communicating with them ahead of time to say, look, make sure you look at this. This is, this is available now. You need to be sort of starting to work through it and think through it. Um, so we, we were trying to keep in contact with them to, to make sure they were aware of that. So the online material um, that we used, uh, it was delivered through Blackboard. There are mixed opinions about Blackboard. Um, it is our university uh, chosen format, so, um, so we stuck with that. Um, I, I know other people have tried other platforms like Moodle and stuff, um, but uh, we, Blackboard did uh, offer us a few advantages in that sense, mainly just the familiarity for the students because it was one that they had been using from the beginning of the year. Um, for this particular module, we organized all the online material into sort of subtopics and or little units that, that it could be worked through individually. And we tried to structure it so that each unit, if you worked through it start to finish, would take about a day. Obviously, judging that was slightly subjective, but that was sort of what we were aiming for. We tried to contain uh, or, or build in a mix of material, uh, so video lectures. We did use some existing open resources as well um, to incorporate those. Um, uh, a few readings, again, a mixture of stuff based on academic papers, but also sort of reports, uh, some quizzes. And those were done, those were built and run within Blackboard. So certain aspects of Blackboard do allow you to build a quiz within your your course content. Um, and it will, if it's multiple choice or you know certain within certain parameters, it will also grade that for you because that was a consideration for us. So those quizzes were strictly formative. Um, they did not form part of the grade. They were just uh, as a, a testing of understanding uh, to help students test their, whether they had understood all the rest of the stuff. <laughs> Um, and then the videos that we produced were, were streamed online using another format called Ensemble, uh, which is a, it's just a, a sort of repository for videos. And it allows them to be streamed rather than downloaded, is basically the, the advantage of it. So, you know, obviously uh, the amount of data and the, and the speed of connections that students might have while accessing this content was a concern. So we had to make sure that they would be able to, um, you know, stream them rather than be forced to download them. Uh, and that's, this is a, a, a tool that the university uses for that. Now to make the video lectures, we, we chose to use them, uh, or to develop them in it using a screencasting app called Explain Everything. Um, <coughs> there are many other ways of doing this. Uh, we chose Explain Everything uh, because, well partly just through access and familiarity. It's, a, it's an inexpensive app, it only costs um, two pounds I think, um, and it's for tablets. Um, or you can get it on your, on your desktop as well. Uh, it offers a few advantages in that it just, um, it works with a lot of our existing practices. So it's one where you can import uh, existing slides into it and then annotate them and narrate over them. Um, it, I think it also works with Prezi and a few other things like that. Uh, has anyone come across this app before? Well, yeah, a few people, yeah. So it's, it's quite common now. Again, it was developed mainly for, for schools, like you know, grade schools, but um, it's sort of, again, kind of slowly making its way in. Um, we only did quite basic things with it in terms of annotating existing slides and doing a narration over top. So the videos that you would see from that are just you know, a slideshow, some, some annotations that would appear, little animations that would appear, and then the voice speaking over top of that. Um, it, uh, again, it did allow people to sort of import slides that they already had, so it, it kind of worked that way. Uh, but it was still a bit of a, a learning curve. Um, and as I say, it's got, it's got, it's pretty powerful though. If you look up online, uh, uh, sort of a, a YouTube search for, for things that are made with Explain Everything, I mean, there's huge ranges of examples now. Um, and it's really, it really is quite powerful. Um, oh, and yeah, and the other advantage was, it made editing quite easy. Uh, so if you want to, you know, 
update material for later years. You can, ed you can edit what you've done for a single slide, whether that's the audio or the animations or what. You can add stuff in and chop it, chop it and change it quite easily. So that was a big advantage for, for future updates. Um, I do have my iPad with me, which has explained everything, explained everything on it. If anyone wants to um, take a look during the break, um, I can try and show it a bit. Uh, so in terms of uh, how students ended up using the online material, this is just a quick snippet. This is one of the advantages that Blackboard has, to be honest. It allows you to be very big brother about everything um, and monitor exactly who's using what. Um, but we, and from the, given that this was the first time we'd run anything like this, this was quite an important um, feature for us to be able to see who was using it. Uh, so this was during the week immediately before the, uh, so this is the week one of the module structure, the week immediately before the in-person stuff. Um, and as you can see, our students, 20-some students, spent about 300 hours um, on the online system. So they did get quite a lot of usage out of it. Uh, the average time during that week was nine hours per user, but that was physical time spent online. Um, and a lot of the readings that we had put up there were downloadable as well. So. So yeah, there, there was probably other time in which they were working through stuff. Uh, so it was good for us to see that they had, um, you know, been accessing it during that week. I think there had been there had been quite a lot of access from January as well. So I mentioned that we had released it ahead of time to make sure that part-time students were using it. So the total number of hours spent uh, by students on the online material was about 500. And as you can see, about 300 of those were spent in this particular week. So it's, it's about what we expected, considering we thought the part-time students would be making more access uh, of it beforehand. But it did, it did get quite a lot of usage, which we were, we were quite pleased to see. Uh, so the contact week, as I said, uh, involved a field trip. And this, because it was water reuse, it went, we went to a, a water recycling plant in London. So again, trying to bring together some of the different elements of the module and, and see them in an applied setting. Uh, we did have a couple of lectures, but these were meant, these were designed as keynote lectures, so they were sort of big picture overview, trying to bring together a lot of different components of, uh, of, the, of the modules, again, just to try and help the students with that sort of big picture thinking and knitting all the different bits together. Um, we only had two of those, and they were only, like, so at only an hour each, so we did, we did try to minimize the sort of traditional lecture. Uh, the main feature during that concept week was a series of workshops. Um, which, as I say, were quite interactive. Students were work, ma work mainly in small groups, doing exercises um, that were that were largely problem based and related directly to what they had to do for their assignment. Uh, and their assignment was to prepare a presentation, which they then delivered at the end of the week as part of the module. Um, and again, it was meant to sort of bring together a lot of the different components of the module. They were given time within that contact week to specifically work on developing their presentation. But we tried to link the workshops and the work for the presentations quite explicitly. So, you know, they, they were working through things that we would then expect to see examples of in their presentations. Uh, so we did get quite a lot of feedback on this, as you can imagine. We were quite uh, keen to know. Uh, this, from the staff, I think the, the main comment was that it was a different way of thinking about lecturing. I think because the tools we were using, there was a temptation for people to think, oh, it'll just be... I'll just adapt one of my existing lectures. You know, it'll be no problem. I'll just shove it into explain everything, record over it, no problem. It is not the same. <laughs> it is quite different. Uh, and it requires, I think because it lays open these connections between, um, you know, what content you're delivering and what you're eventually asking the students to do in their assignments, like, you really have to think through that very carefully. And it is, it, it did take a while for people to get their heads around this way of developing a lecture. Um, and it, was, it did involve quite a different way of thinking about it. Uh, but they liked the fact that, it, that it, it forced this kind of thinking, because it's something that you know, we're probably guilty of not always applying in a lot of our traditional lecturing. Um, and it did, they loved the fact that it freed up the lecture time for just this more, this, this more discursive element, so they could assume that students would be coming to the class with a bit, at least the background knowledge, and they could do uh, some more interactive things. Uh, but as I say, it did, it did take an awful lot of time. There was a, an element of uh, uh, learning on the technology side. People did kind of struggle to get their heads around what Explain Everything could do. Um, and, and to be able to get your head around that and the sort of different format of lecturing, um, 
it did, did really take a lot of time for people. So it did end up being quite resource intensive, in, at least to develop the material to begin with. And people, as we're all busy, people did struggle with that. Um, it, was, it also became slightly more difficult to coordinate between the topics. So different people were responsible for different topics within the module. And we had to try and make sure that those were obviously coordinated so there wasn't too much overlap or mismatch between them. Um, but again, just through busy, sheer busyness of schedules and things, that, that became quite a challenge. Um, so it, it did take some thinking around how we would make sure that the, the topics were properly, properly coordinated with one another. Uh, the students generally, I mean I should say, overall the feedback from them was quite positive. They did highlight a few challenges with it. That um, mainly that it, w it was unclear from the beginning when they sort of were first exposed to this because it's quite different. They weren't quite clear what was expected from them. We did try and mitigate that with um, you know some introductory blurbs. It was mentioned in the introductory week of the whole course to say you know this, actually we're doing this module in this new way. We had a video at the beginning of the module to s explain how it worked and things like that. But even still, it's a very different way of working for the students. Some of them are quite used to the, the sort of passive format of just being able to go and sit in lectures and not have to do much and just absorb things. And to change that to a very self-motivated way of learning to start with was uh, quite difficult for some of them. They found the volume difficult to manage, so they had to uh, sort of manage their time quite efficiently to be able to, uh, particularly the part-timers, um, uh, which we knew was going to be a challenge for them. And they did say that the quizzes that we had developed were a bit too focused on simple recall from, from the readings, you know, did you catch this particular fact, things like that. And, and we acknowledged that that was, that was probably the case. Again, probably because the people developing the quizzes, myself included, weren't really used to developing this sort, these sorts of formative assessments. Um, and in terms of thinking of what to ask that could be easily graded within the Blackboard format, uh, your tendency is just to go towards something a bit fact-based, which is, which is easier to know. Uh, so we do need to think about that and what we're going to use, what we're going to focus the formative assessments on to make it a bit more about comprehension and less just about recall. Uh, but they really appreciated the fact that it was something different, actually. Um, as I say, this module came at the end of their top module, and they liked the fact that it was something a bit different to end on. Um, the, they really appreciated the interactivity. Um, they thought it was a really interesting way of using class time. I mentioned we were doing a lot of this in, in small groups, you know, having them work through problems in small groups. Uh, almost every single time, uh, we, we would give them, you know, a time limit in which to do this particular task. And they would almost always ask for more time to be able to, to work through it. So they were really um, quite engaged with it. And they liked how it linked quite clearly with the assignment and what they needed to do on the assignment. Uh, and they really liked the field trip. I think the field trips are generally always appreciated regardless of what context it's in. But, but they, they, they liked the fact that it was, you know, they had all this background material and then they got to see it in a real context. So I think that sort of the order of events worked quite well. Uh, so what are our future plans on this? Well, we are going to deliver the exact same module. Well, not the exact same, but the same module uh, with incorporating, hopefully, some of the lessons that we've learned um, from this one. Uh, we are planning to do a few more flipped approaches um, to incorporate it the approach, not necessarily with this whole flipped week format as we've done with this one, but we can incorporate flipped elements to it, so maybe just days that are flipped or particular components of the module, so you can, you can break it down a little bit more easily. Uh, we see a lot of potential, particularly for dealing with maths heavy stuff, because that's, that's one thing we didn't have to do in this particular module, but what uh, has been shown as quite a strength of flipped learning is being able to work through problems particularly math-based problems, um, and showing a demonstration of that ahead of time, and then having them work through examples in class and things like that. So that sort of repetition of examples tends to work quite well. Um, elements such as lab skills and sort of basic cross-course elements that can apply to a lot of students. We're definitely looking at how we can apply this approach to, to distributing that kind of learning a bit more widely. And we are trying to maximize the student input to this. We're a bit challenged on that because, as I say, these are one-year taught masters, so we only have our students for a year. Uh, so there's not that continuity of being able to see changes or, or provide input and things like that. Um, and it does, it, it does make that part of it challenging, but we're, we're doing what we can to get as much feedback and input in, into the design as we can. 
We are also trying to develop some central support mechanisms. Um, I think it was mentioned here that there is uh, you know, the, the idea of networks and sharing best practice and things like that. Um, typically, these sorts of approaches have been done in a very sort of pocket-like way. And it's definitely true of Cranfield. You've had people here, people there working on these kinds of materials. The business school side of it was always much more advanced in using these kinds of materials than the rest of the university was. So we're trying to centralize that now and have some more centralized support mechanisms for teaching materials and technology enhanced learning materials and to develop a network of, of sharing these kinds of practices across the university so that it can be a bit more sort of widely distributed. Um, and I would strongly encourage that because I think that just being able to share practices, I think, um, helps immensely uh, for people to get their heads around where do I even start with this. And we are exploring um, new tools for this as well. Uh, one of the limitations of Blackboard, which wasn't such an issue for this course, but would be more of an issue for some of our other courses where, for instance, we have people working at, uh, you know, at distance. Um, if you're working on Blackboard, you have to be online to access a lot of that material, and you have to work through it online. Uh, whereas with something like iBooks, um, you can download the whole iBook once, uh, and then work through all of the material within that unit uh, as, you, as you want. So an iBooks can incorporate the videos, it can incorporate the quizzes, and it can incorporate, it's got a huge range of potential, but all in one package that you download once. So in terms of if, if you've got students working without reliable internet connections, that might be uh, another way of doing it so that you, know, you get the same amount of content, but you can do it a bit more on your own time frame. And you don't need to sit in front of a computer in order to do it. So that's sort of where we're headed. Um, oh, and just to kind of link it back to this idea of online or sort of open resources, we are thinking quite strongly about how, how do we use some of these materials to help develop some more open resources as well. Uh, because, you know, obviously it's, it, there's quite a tendency now to use maybe snippets of lectures or, you know, small aspects. Partly it's a marketing strategy, but partly, you know, it's a sort of a, a community, giving back to the community aspect as well. You know, taking aspects of materials and just posting them online for the public. You know, maybe not quite fully open materials, but at least partially open that people can make use of. Um, and if you're developing these, this kind of content anyway, you know, it, it's, it, I think it's important to be able to think about what else can we use that for, or at least you know, parcel it up to be able to use it for other purposes. Um, a few links and resources. Um, as I say, there's most of the resources you'll find on this kind of stuff are American, because this is where uh, the sort of the, the main use of the of the flipped approach is. Um, the Flip Institute actually has a really good video um, that which I've got a, a, a picture from there involving animated penguins and walrus, um, which is really cute. It's mainly about, uh, it's mainly more for kids and school kids and stuff, but it actually has a really good overview of uh, uh, how the flipped approach works, and it's really quite a nice animation style. Uh, so it's a good, I actually used that video to explain how the module works, so I took the video and, and made it available to the students as a way of saying, here's the rationale for flipped uh, classroom. Um, yeah, there's, a, no, there's not a lot on this kind of approach in the UK at the moment, although um, there's, uh, you know, places like the Higher Education Academy are looking into it a bit more closely. Um, and if anyone's interested in explaining everything, it's developed by uh, a company called Morris Cook. Uh, so I think that's it for me. So, thank you.